Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 17th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is our fourth and final evidence session as part of the committee's inquiry into teacher workforce planning for Scotland schools. Today we will hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills and officials from the Learning Directorate at the Scottish Government. Can I welcome John Swinney, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, Stuart Robb, Acting De Deputy Director, and Mick Wilson, Senior Economic Advisor from the Learning Directorate in the Scottish Government. Thank you for coming along today, and I understand, Cabinet Secretary, that you will be making a short opening statement. Um, thank you, Convener. I welcome this opportunity to give evidence to the Committee and uh, to set out the foundations of the Government's approach to the delivery of workforce planning and education. Um, in Scotland, we have a flexible and child-centred school curriculum, which is part of a wider policy framework to meet the diverse needs of all of our young people at every stage of their journey through life. Young people are educated in modern, accessible buildings, and we have an evidence-based approach to improvement. But the most crucial component is to ensure that children get the right su the support to learn at the right time. And teachers are key to this. Teachers are key to children's achievements at school and to support our ambitions to raise the bar for all and to close the attainment gap. That's why the committee's inquiry into the teaching workforce is important and why ensuring we have a sufficient supply of high-quality teachers is a key policy priority of the government. Evidence to the committee falls into two main areas. Firstly, concern over the skills of newly qualified teachers and secondly, discussions about the national approach to workforce planning. In relation to teacher skills, I was concerned by the evidence presented by trainee teachers about their experience of teacher education. I'm also concerned by the findings in the research that I published two weeks ago, which analysed initial teacher courses and found significant variations in the time spent on key components of the curriculum, with the widest variation in the crucial area of literacy. The committee has also identified in its report on additional support for learning a lack of focus on ASL in initial teacher education and training. I will be meeting with the General Teaching Council for Scotland and the Scottish Council of Deans of Education to consider available evidence in this area and establish how teacher education can be strengthened as a consequence. Improvement is essential, but evidence highlights that teacher education in Scotland is strong. Our universities are of high quality and our own evaluation of Teaching Scotland's future indicated that the experience of teacher education programmes, including student placements, and the probation scheme is positive. The committee has also heard that initial teacher education is just that, initial. Student teachers need the right foundation from initial education, but they are also entitled to ongoing professional development, particularly in the core curricular competences to foster their confidence and competence. My sense is that this remains an area for further work by government, but also by the GTCS, Education Scotland, local authorities and the Scottish College for Educational Leadership. The committee has also discussed the way in which, in conjunction with partners, we plan for the recruitment of new teachers. We have made a number of improvements to the workforce planning model, including, including taking into account local authority vacancies, starting the process earlier in the year and asking universities to work together to allocate places. We will continue to refine the approach through the recently re reconvened Teacher Workforce Planning Working Group. To ensure that we have enough teachers in our schools, we have taken steps to maintain teacher numbers have increased intakes into universities for the sixth year in a row. We are supporting the development of new routes into teaching. And over the last two years, we have invested in a recruitment campaign and will do so again this year. This campaign is a central plank in the Scottish Government's efforts to increase the number of teachers in Scotland. It has a particular focus on STEM subjects this year. And I am delighted that we have seen significant interest from the undergraduates targeted through the campaign in considering a career in teaching. Finally, we need to ensure that our skilled educational professionals are empowered and supported to make the most of the opportunities and responsibilities for the benefit of all children. It is my intention, therefore, to seek to issue a next steps paper next month setting out how we will deliver our ambitions to empower teachers, parents, children and communities. And I remain committed to ensuring that everything we do empowers our schools to deliver excellence and equity for all in Scottish education. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. The, the issue of vacancies you, you mentioned there, and there did seem to be some discrepancy about how accurate and up-to-date the vacancy rates were. Is there some way that the, the government can ensure that local authorities keep these figures 
as updated as they possibly can, and should the government maybe be requesting from them a regular update on the, the vacancy situation? Obviously, the vacancy position will vary at different stages during the year, and I think it, the, the, the whole question comes down to the frequency with which we consider it necessary to gather that information to inform the workforce planning position. What we do is um, gather that information um, via local authorities to inform the teacher workforce planning model and the judgments that are made um, principally about the intake into initial teacher education. And that information will be gathered to inform um, the process of decision making which takes place um, over the latter part of each year um, from um, culminating in December. Now obviously if we gather that information more frequently, um, I think I would have to be clear what the purpose of that was. The purpose of it is clear to me just now is to inform the teacher, um, the, 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 the intake into teach, initial teacher education. Um, and we do that on an annual basis. If we were to gather that information more frequently, then I think we would be faced with issues from local authorities about the degree of administrative burden we were applying to local authorities to collect information for which there was not a, a, a distinct and focused purpose, which there is when we gather it for the teacher workforce model planning exercise. And are you confident that the information that you're getting from the local authorities is as accurate as it could be, or is there any scope for improving the, the data that we're getting? Obviously, we rely on local authorities to give us the quality and what to, to input the quality information that is required for the teacher teaching workforce planning exercise and it's obviously in the interests of local authorities to make sure that data is accurate uh, to make sure that we have the clearest possible position available to us when we make these judgments and of course when we've had that data available to us for the last six years, it has resulted in an increase in the intake into initial teacher education, and that has been the case um, again for the um, the entry into the forthcoming academic year. Okay, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. Liz? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you said in the parliamentary debate uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you've reiterated this morning, that you are disappointed by many of the findings uh, within the recent ITE report. Um, could I ask you whether you're actually surprised by some of these findings, given the Donaldson review and the determination that the Scottish Government had at the time when it published its interim report to improve things? I think the, the, the work of the Donaldson review, um, I think, has been taken forward in partnership with the um, colleges of education to ensure that the recommendations have been put into practice and that initial teacher education is of sufficient quality. I think we've got to look at a range of different factors. You know, when we look at the, um, the, uh, the complete university guide, which I was citing in the parliamentary debate, it rated um, four of our universities in the top seven across the UK for teacher education. So in that respect, it's a pretty strong endorsement of the quality and the strength of initial teacher education. Um, but obviously, what the analysis that I published demonstrated was that there is significant variation in the amount of time and um, focus within individual courses. And uh, that merits examination and explanation. I'm not going to ju jump to an immediate conclusion about it just because it's different, because that, you know, there may well be a legitimate explanation that the universities will marshal for that factor. But the, the, the margin of its range is sufficient to say to me, we need to explore that further to satisfy ourselves that the evidence on the one hand that suggests there is strength and capability within our colleges of education um, is actually the valid piece of evidence to uh, to vest upon, given the fact that um, we've had that data which the government has produced, which suggests variation, and then some of the evidence the committee has heard, which um, clearly um, is, you know, raises other issues as well. So I think in amongst all of these 
questions, I think we have to be open to exploring whether or not um, the colleges of education um, have, in the design of initial teacher education, taken all the steps that need to be taken to make sure we can be confident that the foundations of initial teacher education are secure. Could, could I just pursue this point? Because it was quite clear in the uh, Donaldson Review in 2011 that literacy and numeracy were very specific issues and uh, Donaldson had some recommendations on that. And then if I just quote to you what you said in your interim uh, re review on report of how Donaldson was being enacted, uh, it was very clear that there, there were concerns uh, about, and I quote, relatively limited literacy and numeracy skills and a lack of in-depth subject knowledge uh, amongst many teachers. Uh, and that was um, you know, fairly recent. Could you explain why you think that, given the warnings that were issued in 2011 and what the Scottish Government said itself, why is it that we are still in a scenario where we've got quite a number of witnesses telling us that the quality of delivery on literacy and numeracy is really very weak in some areas? I, I think it. Well, I think it's. I, I think the point that, um, well, the words that Liz Smith used at the latter part of her question. Um, in some areas is important for us to remember because um, I, I do come back to the fact that we have external validation that suggests our initial teacher education proposition is strong. Um, so we've got to look at all of this evidence together to come to a considered judgment about what needs to be undertaken to ensure our confidence in initial teacher education. Because essentially, in, 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 in amongst all of this material, we have the testimony that the committee has heard from uh, some candidates. We've got the external validation of the strength of initial teacher education. We've got the government's report, which suggests quite a substantial range in the focus within initial teacher education, more so on literacy than on numeracy, but certainly um, uh, quite a range. And that therefore merits um, further exploration and examination to give us the confidence that the system that we have in place uh, meets the needs of, um, of our education system today. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, obviously, one of the, the great concerns is that the Scottish standards of uh, literacy and numeracy are not nearly as good as we would like them to be. And, you know, it has to be set in that context. Where do you think the Scottish Government can play a role in bringing together universities who are autonomous institutions and decide their own courses, the GTC, and the uh, local authorities who obviously have an important part to play, not in the actual specific teacher training, but in the way that it is managed? How do you, as Cabinet Secretary, envisage the way forward to cut through this problem that we do have in literacy and numeracy and to... Uh, raise standards across the board because I think that's the question that parents would want to have answered. Well, there's a number of things that the government can do and a number of things the government's already done. The first was to recognise in the guidance that the Chief Inspector of Education issued to all practitioners in August of last year that within the eight curricular areas there was primacy for literacy and numeracy, or there should be primacy for literacy, numeracy, and health and well-being. And that was a very explicit statement that I asked the Chief Inspector of Education to make, to give clarity to the profession that, although Curriculum for Excellence relies upon, and I'm a strong advocate of its breadth of delivery, there are certain elements within it that must be anchored, if I can put it that way. And therefore, the Chief Inspector's guidance to practitioners in August was designed to do exactly that. Uh, so that's the first thing the government can do. Uh, the second is to put in place absolute clarity about what we expect in relation to literacy and numeracy. Uh, so the benchmarks that were published in August, along with the Chief Inspector's guidance, are de designed to give to um, practitioners the absolute clarity about what levels we expect young people to reach at different stages in their educational journey. And from the feedback that I get, and I listen very carefully to this feedback, the, those benchmarks are providing the necessary clarity that previously did not exist on those questions. 
Um, because I think, in all honesty, we cannot expect teachers to try to get young people to particular levels if we're not crystal clear about what those levels are. And I think that position has now been addressed. So that's the second thing the government has done. The third thing, and, and, and the way in which Liz Smith asks her question essentially almost answers itself, is the universities are autonomous bodies. And the first person in the queue to remind me of that will, of course, be Liz Smith. And um, so what the government has to do is to lead a process involving all interested parties to make sure that initial teacher education is um, delivering all that we require it to deliver for, for, for uh, aspiring teachers. So in my earlier comments, I said that I would be convening a discussion with the GTCS, with the Colleges of Education, uh, I'm very happy to involve the local government in that process as well, um, to ensure that we have the necessary focus on addressing these issues, and that's part of the work that I will take forward. I have, of course, already met the Colleges of Education and um, set out very clearly to them my expectations of what uh, I would be looking for from initial teacher education but also the role I expect them to play within the development of our education system, because these are very significant um, research centres for educational development, and I want the Scottish education system to benefit from that input. My final question, uh, which is a big one. With hindsight, do you think that the curriculum for excellence has been part of the problem in that the uh, teaching profession has had to focus on too many other things to the detriment of focusing on literacy and numeracy? Curriculum for Excellence is a broad curriculum to enable young people to have the capacities to face an ever-changing and dynamic world. And in that respect, and you know, it's not just my opinion, it's the whole approach of Curriculum for Excellence has been validated from international commentators. So I'm very confident in its strength and its breadth. I think what's been necessary to do is to provide um, a clarity that in amongst the eight curricular areas, we attach greater significance to three of those elements, which are literacy, numeracy, and health and well-being. And that's important clarity to have given to the system to make sure that what we need to ensure young people are equipped to, uh, to, 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 to be competent in um, are these core skills and whatever else young people are equipped for out of the breadth of curriculum for excellence, they have to have that strength of foundation in literacy, numeracy and health and wellbeing. Mr. Daniel, do you want to comment on this point? Um, yeah. Andrew? Um, so there are around 700 vacancies uh, across schools in Scotland, and I think we can all agree that, that that has to be a sort of a key priority to make sure those get filled. So therefore, the target for student teachers and making sure those student teachers end up in the classroom is, is critical. So I'm afraid I've been doing some number crunching, um, but I'm sure you'll be able to uh, cope with that, Cabinet Secretary. If you look at the, the, the probational cohort for 2015-16, that was 2,500 or so. Um, but the target uh, number of student teachers for that year, looking back up the way, was around 3,000. If you include the numbers of teachers who weren't employed at all from that cohort, you have something around 20 to 25 per cent discrepancy between the targeted number of teachers and the number of teachers that end up in the court. Are you at all concerned about the dropout rate that there may be through that process from recruitment of those student teachers to the actual numbers of teachers working in the classroom? Of, of course that's an issue of concern, yes, because if we, you know, the model that we take forward is a model that looks at a whole range of different factors, with which Mr Johnston will be familiar, around pupil numbers, um, census information about pupils, um, the age profile of the profession, the number of exits that we anticipate, a whole variety of different factors, uh, uh, attention paid to particular specialisms to ensure that the, the, these factors are properly taken into account. So, the workforce planning model is looking at a whole range of different factors to arrive at an assumption of how many teachers we need to train to ensure we have an adequate supply of teachers within the classroom. 
Now, if that, and within that, there will be an assumption made about the proportion of teachers that we might expect in any given year to decide it's not for them or, or if life changes or whatever. Uh, obviously, if that's exceeded, then we have an issue. And uh, so the issue that Mr Johnson raises is, is a, a material issue and one that we need to understand uh, carefully what would be the reasons for that to be the case and what we can do to try to address those reasons. Uh, well, thank you for that answer. So, uh, I mean, according to uh, TESS, there's a 5.6% dropout rate from the PGDE. And then again, according to that, those figures on the probational cohort, 13% of teachers who've completed their probation year aren't then being employed, despite the fact that there are 700 vacancies. So that would suggest that both there are issues with the, the course and potentially issues with the experiences of, of probation. I mean, do you have a view of what those issues might be and, 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 and how the government might propose to tackle them? The, there will be a range of different issues. Um, some of them will be about individuals um, getting further experience of teaching and not believing it's the right thing for them to do, or there may be changes in their um, uh, their own lives and their own priorities that will assess some of these questions. What we um, what we need to be attentive to is to understanding in our dialogue with those candidates what are the issues so that we can best address them in the way in which initial teacher education is taken forward um, and that any of those points can be properly addressed within the system to minimise the type of um, dropout rates that Mr Johnson raises. Now, we'll never eliminate those. I think it would be... I think it'd be um, foolhardy of me to suggest that that could be the case. Um, but we do need to have them within a, 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 an expected level to ensure that the assumptions we are making about the teacher workforce, uh, within the teacher workforce planning system, um, are assumptions that uh, can be validated. So, as I said at the beginning, it's the combination of factors of retaining those students, but also having the right target in the first place. And given that the, the target number of student teachers fluctuated from uh, 4,437 in 05-06, down to 2,300 uh, uh, in 11-12, and then back up to 3,706 in 1617. Uh, given that high degree of fluctuation in a relatively short space of time, I mean, does, does that raise questions in your mind in terms of the, 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 the satisfactory uh, nature uh, and accuracy of that model? And are you confident those issues have been addressed? I think the, 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 important, the numbers that Mr Johnson uses are, 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 are the correct numbers. But I think that the other caveat that has to be added, other factor that has to be taken into this, this, this conversation, is about the position that was pertaining in 2008, 9, 9, 10, 10, 11, which was a high level of um, teacher unemployment, if I can use that terminology. And the model obviously was recalibrated to take into account the fact that teachers couldn't get employment at that time. And our desire was to make sure teachers could get employment where they had been trained to do so. Now, obviously, there has been quite a variation in the intake levels, but they have been affected by the surplus of teachers being able to secure employment. And I think what we have to be confident about, and you know, this is a planning model, it's not going to be an exact science, but we have to have a sufficiently long-term line of sight to make sure that we're making the correct judgments to take into account the level of retirement uh, or departure from the profession and the relevant intakes. And there's really quite significant variables that will happen in that exercise. But... I can assure the committee that maintaining that um, clear line of sight is an absolute priority for the government to ensure that we are able to maintain the correct approach to teacher training intake and therefore to the supply of individuals into the profession. Yeah. I, I quite agree about having that line of sight and I think one of the concerns from our evidence last week that was that the, that that line of sight was really limited to, to vacancy data, data from um, local authorities, uh, rather than looking at 
the, 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 the total picture of number of schools, uh, workforce models, teaching formulas that might be employed by individual local authorities. Um, so therefore, on the basis of that, do you think that the, the formula needs to inc incorporate more data points, in particular looking at that, that, that pattern of, of schools, models of teaching, uh, and also particularly moving from a year-to-year -year forecast and maybe a three, four or five-year planning horizon? And can I just also ask, do you think there was an overcorrection to that first point you made in that last answer in terms of that teacher vacancy? Do you think these numbers have suggested that there was an overcompensation for that? On, on the first point, um, the statistical model that we operate takes into account a very broad number of factors. It takes into account population and pupil number projections. It takes into account pupil census, census the teacher census, the age profile of the current teacher workforce, teachers leaving and returning to the profession, uh, pupil-teacher ratios at school, at individual school level. Um, it takes into account the need for some flexibility to meet the need for short-term cover staff. It takes into account assumptions on student retention rates, the issues that we've just talked about, and also the vacancy survey. So the vacancy survey is one of a range of different factors that are taken into account in the model. Um, now, in relation to um, projections about um, numbers, we, we do take into account a longer-term perspective than just one individual year, but obviously we formulate on a year-by-year -year basis the target teacher training intake number because it's only relevant for that one academic year. But we are looking at projections of all of those factors that I talked about there over a longer period of time, but it crystallises into what is going to be the teacher training intake for 17-18, and the judgment is made on that point. Um, so all of those factors are, are taken into account. I think clearly with the benefit of hindsight, um, there is uh, the intake numbers in 2011 were probably overcorrected too far, and um, but judgments were made at that time based on the level of uh, teacher unemployment. If I was to hazard a guess as to what had been relevant in that, uh, in that period, um, I suspect we had a proportion of a greater number of teachers leaving the profession because of some of the issues around workload, which I have now acted to address. And um, uh, if, if I was you know, coming to a conclusion on this point, I would um, imagine that that factor has um, exceeded what was expected in the uh, statistical model that we took forward. Yeah, thank you very much. Tavis, you had asked. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just a couple of supplementaries to uh, Daniel Johnson's questions about the model itself. Um, when Lawrence Finlay from Murray Council gave evidence um, a couple, three weeks ago, his argument, which I would obviously concur with, was about the need for the model to be more localised um, and indeed maybe possibly in the future reflect the regional approach, for example, the Northern Alliance. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I certainly think the model has got to address all circumstances in all localities, but I would want to assure... Um, Mr. Scott and the committee, that the, um, the the position at local level is very directly taken into account in the formulation of the model as it stands, and that's done with pupil-teacher ratios at individual school level, but it's also taken into account in relation to the vacancy survey in relation to every local authority in the country, which is contributing towards that at local level. Now, I think what follows from Mr Scott's question is um, what are the particular challenges or issues in particular parts of the country? And in that respect, we have to make sure that um, the statistical model reflects those challenges, um, which I am pretty confident that it does, but that our approach to initial teacher education and the work to deploy probationers around the country also takes into account some of those challenges in different parts of the country as well. 
the um, uh, coincidentally, actually not coincidentally at all, I met um, Helen Bowes, the Director of Education, at home yesterday, and she said they're struggling with probationers for the new year, for the new academic year, and they've also got vacancies which cannot be dissimilar to any part of Scotland in that sense, but we've got particular challenges in certain subjects in, in Shetland. To, uh, uh, and the logic of that, or rather the consequences of that, are that some subjects may, and I quickly use the word may, may not be taught <coughs> next, next academic year because of those vacancies. Is the system yet dealing with those kind of immediate challenges? I appreciate those are three months away, but they are, for parents, real concerns now. Obviously, we, uh, we will strive and work with our partners to ensure that there is um, the delivery of the breadth of the curriculum that um, that is expected across the country. Um, there will be a number of um, steps to be taken before we get to the start of the, the, the academic year um, to address some of these questions and the probationary position will become clearer by that time and uh, Mr Scott is correct there's still some time uh, for that to uh, to take its its, its course and um, there are of course other uh, reforms that we're taking forward that will help in the delivery of education where there are shortages um, uh, the uh, the government has funded um, Western Isles Council to take forward the e-school provision which is designed to address some of these issues by distance learning and I think there are um, uh, this is one of the tools that I think will be crucial in helping us to address any shortages if they materialise in that respect. Um, but obviously we are working very hard with the colleges of education to expand intake, uh, to ensure that we have the right flow of probationers working into the system and obviously local authorities are actively involved in the recruitment process as we speak. I appreciate that. Lawrence Finney also mentioned the preference waiver scheme, and he argued that, I think he said, and I, if I may quote him directly, we could make the, prefer well, the preferential scheme a little bit more preferential. Would you accept that that's something that could at least be explored? It, it certainly, um, we, we, we need to explore um, all of these questions to make sure that we have the right teaching cohort in every part of the country. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Joy? Before I go on to the subject that I really was wanting to ask you around um, making the profession um, inviting for, for graduates, um, I want to follow on from something that Tavish Scott was saying about um, the localisation of, of planning um, and to bring up something that's actually quite current in, in my area that I have discovered yesterday um, in that the, the impact of a local authority's political um, uh, administration does have an impact on this uh, very clearly. I've just found out that the current administration for Aberdeenshire Council is, is talking about closing rural schools in my area. So given that we have heard that we've got problems with actually schools taking on probationers, we've got problems with, uh, with um, uh, attracting people into, into to rural areas to, to work and teach, how does this kind of decision impact on the job that you're trying to do? Obviously, um, the, well, there, there are two quite separate processes here. Um, one is about um, possible school closures, and Gillian Martin will be familiar that there is a, a very clear process that has to be followed by any local authority that wishes to act in that fashion, and that um, in large numbers of cases I will be the decision maker on uh, ultimately on these questions um, as to whether the due process has been followed and uh, obviously all local authorities have to consider that before they come to any of these conclusions and clearly um, the detail that I put on the record a moment ago about the workforce planning statistical model relies on data about numbers of schools uh, structure of schools, profile of schools, school teacher ratios, uh, pupil, pupil teacher ratios within schools. Uh, there will be a wide variety of factors that will be relevant and will have an impact on the, uh, the steps that the government takes in, in, in leading this process. Uh, so yes, if there is a reconfiguration of the school estate, then that, uh, that will have an effect on, on, on our work. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Now I can come on to the subject that I really want to ask you about uh, this morning, and that's about um, making teaching uh, attractive to graduates. So I know that the government are doing a lot of work in this area. Um, but a lot of the people that were in front of us in the last couple of weeks um, from the various bodies were saying that that really is a real issue in the way that teaching is talked about in the media, the way that teaching is talked about in, in this place as well. 
is really off-putting to quite a lot of people who are looking for it to decide on their career. And I, I'd be interested in your, your thoughts on that. I think, the, I think the way in which education is talked about will have an effect on the attractiveness of the, um, of the profession. And I certainly have taken steps in my communication about the profession to recognise the absolutely fundamental role that teaching as a profession performs within our society, that recognises the reliance that we have on a quality teaching profession and on the exciting opportunities to transform lives as a consequence. Um, the government has reflected those aspirations in the recent campaign, uh, Teaching Makes People, which in a sense captures in one line the attractiveness and the power of the teaching profession and the ability to be um, to, to, to shape the lives of young people within our society. So I think our message centrally is designed to create an attractive uh, approach for the profession. Uh, but I do acknowledge that um, a lot of the debate and the mood music around education can sometimes uh, be a challenge to, uh, to, to, to compete with in putting across that positive and attractive message about the profession. And may also, I mean, going back to, to the issue uh, around some of the things that, that may potentially put uh, graduates off from entering, is about the progression into to head teachers. And Greg Dempster from ADA, AHDS um, was talking about workload and about the issues about workload for head teachers. And obviously, if people, graduates are looking towards maybe a career pro progression and then going into a headship <coughs> at one point, this is, has an impact. Um, and he was saying, our members have told us their top seven workload issues. The first is reduction and removal of class cover. Now, that's a local authority issue um, in terms of staffing. And um, I wonder, you obviously will have seen a lot of all the evidence that's been put before us. Um, we heard that certain local authorities were not putting class cover in place over, they, they were expecting that teachers would cover classes because they weren't putting supply teachers in place for up to a, cu a couple of weeks. Now, obviously, that's not something that you can do anything about, but local authorities have to recognise the workload issues around head teachers having to cover classes because they can't get supply is, a, is an issue. One of my priorities has been to tackle the workload issue um, right across the profession. And um, I have taken a number of steps, as the committee will be familiar, to try to address that issue through the clarity that's been provided through the Chief Inspector of Education's guidance um, by the removal of unit assessments in the senior phase, uh, for example, uh, by providing the clarity around the, uh, the benchmarks that are in place. And I've also led a process which has involved all aspects of the system, the government, Education Scotland, the SQA and local authorities, but also schools, to tackle the issues of unnecessary bureaucracy. And the guidance that was issued in August was designed to empower the teaching profession to be much more selective about what particular elements of bureaucracy and workload um, they pursued. But also, put a requirement on local authorities to rein back the volume of bureaucracy and workload that is applied to schools. And um, I asked Education Scotland to look at this. They gave us a very clear report which demonstrated that since the um, reducing workload um, reports had been undertaken uh, under the auspices of the Assessment and Qualifications Group a couple of years ago, some authorities had made good progress in reducing workload, others had some way to go, and others were not even at the starting blocks. So that message has been communicated to local authorities. It's been monitored by Education Scotland. But fundamentally, what would help the position is if local authorities tackled some of that, that unnecessary bureaucracy um, to ensure that the teaching profession is able to do what I want it to do, which is to be liberated to concentrate on teaching. But it's not, I mean, just come back to what Greg Dev said, the number one thing is not necessarily the bureaucracy, although it has ha people have mentioned that. It's about teachers having to cover other classes because local authorities won't have, have a, uh, put a supply teacher in place immediately when they have a situation where a teacher's maybe off sick. So schools are actually having to cover for a period of time 
um, until uh, the local authority puts a, a supply teacher in place, and, and that seems to be a, a major issue in some areas of, of Scotland. I think there'll be two issues here. One will be about the availability of supply cover, and if we have a general shortage of members of the teaching profession, there may well be challenges in the availability of supply cover in all parts of the country. And uh, that's, again, another factor that goes into the workforce planning model to ensure that we have um, adequate levels of um, a, a, a supply cover available within the system, the flexibility and the size of the workforce to, to, to meet the need for short-term cover for staff. Uh, so there will be um, genuine issues that have to be confronted there. Um, secondly, there, there will be choices that are made by local authorities as to what their you know, how quickly they put supply cover in place. And uh, that is um, something which I would encourage local authorities to be supportive towards schools in delivering uh, that degree of uh, cover as quickly and as promptly as it can be put in place uh, to ensure that young people are able to be supported in their education. Thank you. And Colin? Um, Captain Secretary, workforce planning, a key element of this must be retention of teachers. And we've had a number of different uh, reasons given as to why teachers leave the profession. And I may say, on some of the subjects, there's, there's not unanimity from the people appearing in front of us. One of them is in relation to salary. There's, so there were some assertions that salary at, in the initial years for, a, for a, a teacher was too low and not attracting them into the profession. But for, after four or five years, it reached a level that appeared to be satisfactory. Now, I know there's issues maybe at a more senior level, but during those critical initial years, now, there was no unanimity on this. And I just wondered what your opinion on that was. Obviously, the, the, the issue of salary is an issue taken forward by the SNCT process, of which the government is one of the three participants in that process. The pay rates and pay scales are designed to make the profession attractive, to provide um, the necessary incentives to encourage individuals to come into the profession and then to progress through the profession. I think we have to be ever mindful of ensuring that that um, remains attractive to individuals. And obviously I'm conscious that in the course of the last um, nine years, there has been significant pay constraint applied to um, public sector workers, which will include teachers. And we have to be mindful of that in taking forward uh, our discussions within the SNCT. But fundamentally, we've got to provide um, a a, a sufficiently attractive set of pay scales for individuals, but we must also ensure that we address some of the issues that Gillian Martin raised with me about the, you know, the, the, the powerful message to attract individuals to come into the profession, given um, what the profession, um, the opportunities the profession offers to individuals as a consequence. And another aspect that was raised was the question of promotion opportunities. Now, obviously, the structure in uh, most schools has been flattened uh, with less uh, promotion opportunities through the ranks. And that obviously affects teachers at a, a, a sort of middle ranking level. Is, is, do you have any opinion on that? I, I'm concerned about this point because what I think has happened is that I think we've lost an element um, of leadership of learning because in a it's not in every circumstance, but generally, schools have moved towards um, broader faculty structures in which the leadership of learning in a subject, for example, um, uh, like history, um, would have previously been undertaken by a principal teacher of history, but that is now likely to be led by a principal teacher of a much broader set of disciplines. Um, and therefore, the ability to enhance the quality and the depth of learning and teaching within schools um, is made more remote by the fact that there isn't that immediate leadership. And obviously it plays into the type of um, scenario that Mr Beattie puts to me about 
the opportunities for individuals to progress themselves through that process. So the, 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 there are significant issues about professional development that uh, I'm exploring as part of the governance review, which address the points that Mr Beattie has raised with me. An another point that was raised was additional support needs and the difficulty that teachers have in addressing these, uh, partly due to the complexity of these additional support needs and the concern that perhaps it was difficult to give teachers the breadth of training that was necessary to cover all the potential conditions that they might meet in the classroom. And there was also the concern about, uh, obviously, an element of disruption in the classroom. But a number of teachers have actually raised this as a, as a significant issue for them in terms of carrying out their duties. And again, I, I wondered how we were tackling that. I think there's, there's two elements to handling this question which are important. One is that we have to, I think all teachers going through initial teacher education need to be properly equipped with the, the necessary skills to support young people with additional support needs. But I think we also have to recognise there's a limit to just how broad we can make, ensure the capacity of the teaching profession to, to, to do that uh, through initial teacher education. So that brings me on to the second point, which is that where a young person is judged to be able to operate within a mainstream school environment, the support that that young person requires must be properly considered on the educational and social needs of that young person so that their needs are being met. That is surely the meaning of getting it right for every child. So a teacher's ability to support a young person to fulfil their potential within the classroom would therefore be a blend of the core skills that they had as a teacher to address the needs of young people with additional support needs, but also reinforced by the um, capacity that would be present within the classroom to ensure that they were able to do exactly that. And that, and that judgment would be arrived at by the process of assessing what are the needs of this young person and can they be met within a mainstream school environment. So I don't, think it's, I don't think we can just take the view that additional support needs will, in all circumstances, be properly addressed by initial teacher education. I think we've got to make sure that the foundations are unreservedly. But I think we've also got to make sure that there are a proper, proper resources in place to support the delivery of education to meet the needs of young people, which is their entitlement given the policy framework within which we operate? I think, I think from the feedback uh, we had, it was clear that a number of the teachers felt that they lacked confidence to deal with the complexity of some of the additional support needs that came in front of them. And uh, I wonder how that could be better addressed. Well, I, th I think the, the, there will be um, specific needs of the teaching profession to be addressed um, as part of ensuring that they, are, that they have got that necessary confidence to support young people with additional support needs. And um, certainly the, the judgment, in arriving at a judgment about whether or not a young, person's edu with, a young person with additional support needs, whether those needs can be met within a, a, a mainstream environment, will rely heavily on the resources that are put in place and what training and support is put in place to the teacher to enable that teacher to be um, able to meet those needs in every respect. Uh, Liz, you've got a very brief... Just a brief point. You made a very interesting comment uh, in answer to Mr Beattie about the issue with departmental leadership, namely that because of the way that curriculum for excellence has been developed, there has been a move towards uh, faculty-based uh, leadership within schools rather than departmental ones. Do you believe that the Curriculum for Excellence has, perhaps unwittingly, provided a problem that there has been a diminution of the core subjects as a result of that, which has had an impact on subject choice? I think uh, Liz Smith misinterprets my remarks. I don't think Curriculum for Excellence has been the driver of this process to 
uh, to, to move to broader faculty leadership. I think that's been decisions taken by local authorities to flatten the structures. I don't think that's had anything to do with Curriculum for Excellence. And I think what Curriculum for Excellence requires is, and this is, you know, in my view, a point that just cannot be contested, um, is a depth of learning to enable young people to be able to establish the foundations um, in the broad general education that will allow them to be competent in the senior phase and to achieve qualifications. So um, I think, I know Liz Smith um, has her issues about curriculum for excellence, but I certainly don't want her to misconstrue my remarks that um, I see curriculum for excellence delivering depth of learning for young people. It has to be at a satisfactory level in the broad general education to create the foundations that allow young people to perform at all of the subjects that, with which we're all familiar in the senior phase. Um, but that, so that necessity of deep learning, which is actually one of the purposes of Curriculum for Excellence, lies at the heart of that agenda. And um, the move to faculty heads and a flatter structures is, is about local authority choices. It's not about CFE. Okay, do you want? Okay, um, thanks very much. Can I ask just a, a brief point about initial teacher education before I go on to really my main focus, which is on a proper understanding of what's happening in our schools. Some of the evidence that seemed to me that we got was a recognition that the, the route into teaching has changed from when I started out, where it was a lot of graduates went in, did a postgraduate course and went into um, full-time teaching. And that was, so it was young people going into teaching by that route. We're seeing now people wanting perhaps to come into teaching at a later stage. Um, and I think we would be encouraging that because that experience that they can bring into the classroom is very significant. But it doesn't feel like initial teacher education has changed in its view of what a student actually is. <clears throat> Excuse me, we had some evidence of people talking about just how difficult it was for them to take a year out to commit to, to doing this course and then being expected to travel to various different placements and so on. What do you think should be done in terms of accessing these courses, perhaps part-time, uh, distance learning, these things that you would be keen to develop? But also, how do we make these courses more sympathetic to the reality is that people who are now becoming into teaching will have family commitments, will have caring commitments, are less free just to travel to wherever um, the, the placements might expect them to go? I, 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 I think these are all um, reasonable and legitimate issues, recognising the fact that those going into teaching may be different from just being a, a, a a course that follows on or is a, 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 a distinct undergraduate course that an individual takes forward. There are, of course, a number of very good examples of how courses have been adapted to do that. For example, a number of local authorities, Perth and Kinross Council that I represent is one of them, um, in, has a, 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 a partnership in place that enables its existing employees who maybe, let's say, for example, work in the housing service to decide to opt to enter the teaching profession and the council essentially supports them as part of that process to enable them to do that. So they don't have to face the, um, can I manage for a year without salary and meet the costs of, uh, of, of associated with, with, with education. So there are a number of um, measures that are taken to that are already in place, but I, I'm very keen to explore how we can take further measures to broaden the base of intake. I think the second issue that is valid in the points that John Lamont raises is about some of the practical manifestations of um, the work that has to be undertaken by a trainee teacher. So, uh, you know, I, I saw a constituent the other week there who was training to be um, a teacher. Um, who has family commitments and has gone into teaching at a, a, a later stage in life. Um, but the travel time to placements essentially upset the apple cart of childcare, which she would normally be able to, to, to manage. So I think being sympathetic 
to the particular needs of individuals who may have these other responsibilities in how we take forward um, elements of placements and other elements of initial teacher education, I think would perhaps address some of the issues that make it difficult for people to decide to enter the profession in the first place and to sustain that as a consequence of, their, uh, of the implications for their own lives. Okay, thank you. To move on to this question of workforce planning, I'm interested to under whether we actually are understanding properly what's happening in our schools. Is there a gap between theoretically what a school is, what it's offering, and what the truth is? And we've had evidence, for example, head teachers in primary schools routinely covering for classes and therefore don't have management time. Non-specialist teaching further down secondary school because the specialist teachers have to focus on those who have got exams and therefore you're not getting perhaps the quality of teaching at, at, at the lower levels that you might have expected. Deduction in specialist teachers in primary schools. And some examples where when a teacher leaves, that becomes not a vacancy, but a decision by the school no longer to run that course. And I can think of an example around computing science. Now that wouldn't be captured in any survey around vacancies, but it makes a significant difference to what's happening in the schools. And I wonder how we address this question, because I think that impacts both on the capacity of a school to deliver on core issues like literacy, numeracy, and subject specialisms, but also has a huge impact on what it's like to be a teacher in that school, because it's not, it's not steady. It's not steady if, if you've got you know, a lack of supply, teachers can be able to come in, free people out to do courses and so on. And I wonder whether you, have you had any um, examination of this issue that basically we're managing problems with accessing teachers by perhaps reducing the curriculum or changing how the, how the curriculum is delivered within individual schools? Um, I, I think... We, we haven't undertaken a scientific exercise on that point, but I recognise some of the challenges that Joanne Lamont raises, and I hear about them when I am out and about within the education system. And some of them will be driven by the difficulties of recruitment of subject specialists, and we know that we have particular challenges within the STEM subjects, for example, which um, can result in acute difficulties in the provision of certain courses. Some of them are also arising out of the availability of supply cover. Um, so where a school may wish to undertake some professional development, the availability of, of supply cover will determine whether or not that professional development should, is able to be undertaken, which is not an acceptable conclusion, in, in, in my view. We have to make sure that we have adequate supply to, to enable professional uh, learning and development to be undertaken. And uh, some of it will relate to the general challenges we face about the recruitment of, of teachers into the profession to ensure that we have the necessary stability uh, within our teaching cohort. Now, one of the points that I made in the... <coughs> I think I made in the debate on initial teacher education, but I certainly made it in response to recent oral questions that I have answered. Is that when I met the uh, or participated in the International Summit on the Teaching Profession in Edinburgh in late March, it was clear from a number of jurisdictions around that table the challenges that exist around the attractiveness of teaching as a profession and therefore the recruitment of teachers into a number of jurisdictions. So we are not alone as a country in wrestling with the, um, the availability of teachers. But what we have to do is to try to take the steps that we can take, and which I believe we are taking, to ensure that we have a number of diverse routes to encourage people to come into teaching to strengthen the availability of numbers within the system, which can then enable a more stable approach to be taken to the delivery of education. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Claire? Okay, convener, and can I just pick up a, a little bit on what uh, uh, Joanne Lamont was, uh, was asking about the Cabinet Secretary? So, given the, uh, the sort of time limitations of the PGD, um, you know, a one-year course, um, whether there needs to be much more focus on 
uh, CPD for early career teachers to retain them within those professions and what your thoughts would be on that? There's, um, I, I think there's got to be a constant focus on CPD um, to enhance learning and teaching within our schools. And one of the issues that uh, we discussed at the International Summit, the teaching profession, which you know, is attended by the government and our trade unions, um, so we we have to agree joint venture joint measures to take forward as a consequence. And one of the measures that we agreed with the EIS and the SSTA and the um, Association of Head Teachers and Deputy Head Teachers in Scotland was the importance of continuing professional learning and professional development in which our trade unions would be participants in that process to enable us to enhance that uh, continuous yeah. learning and development. Okay, uh, you had a couple of short supplements. Uh, a couple of questions, if I may uh, convene. The first was on online security for children and young people, which we obviously rehearsed um, at, at uh, the debate some uh, weeks ago, uh, and I'm grateful for the response on that. Um, would you be possible to give the committee an update as to uh, how that is going to fit in, because I was taken with the evidence that the principal of Murray College of Education gave, uh, again, a couple of weeks back, where she said they've got to squeeze that into everything else, and you've just made much of literacy and numeracy, and clearly there's going to be some more on happening that. Yet we cannot have trainee teachers, going, probationers going into classrooms without a very full understanding of the dangers of online security, given the world that, you rightly said, is changing around us. So h how does space be found for that kind of issue? Well, I think we, we've... We have to make sure within initial teacher education that we are covering the necessary bases that are relevant to teachers exercising their responsibilities within the classroom. And there are a lot of, there, there's a lot of ground to cover. And the, the challenge will be that um, to ensure that we have the necessary key attributes and elements covered within that initial teacher education and then if necessary to be supplemented by the type of approach that Claire Hockey was talking about, about continuous professional development once individuals are in the teaching profession. So that suggests once they're actually at school? The, the, the initial teacher education has got to cover all bases, yeah. but it might not have to cover absolutely everything that one might know or might need to know and continuous professional development yeah. has a role in enhancing that capability and but, but that knowledge. I accept that, but the slightly worrying thing the committee found out in the previous evidence sessions from teachers themselves and the trainee teachers were, is they're getting none on online security at the moment. And, and I think these things have got to be reflected yeah. in initial teacher okay, education. Thank you. The other one I would just wanted to ask again in response to and following from one of my colleagues who, um, about uh, work pressure and workload. Um, I hope you might accept that when Linda Robertson, again a teacher, gave evidence the other week, she said uh, on, and this was about um, computing and jo Joanne Lamont's uh, uh, points on this, uh, that uh, the changes to N5 happened very, they were, they were correct, it's good to happen, but they happened so late in the year, with three weeks to go before the start of the new uh, year. And Linda Robertson said, and I quote, basically we were told what the changes were, the SQA is not interested in dialogue. I was pretty concerned about that because we have rehearsed in this committee time and time again the need for the SQA and Education Scotland to be a heck of a lot more responsive to the workload pressures. And that rather suggested from a teacher at the grassroots that, you know, you introduced a change, or the system introduced a change there, a change that many of us would support, but it happened so late in the year and then it was just walloped into classrooms as usual. No change. Okay. Um, well, if people want National 5 units to be removed and they are removed, they get what they, what they wish for. And there are then consequences of that. Three well, three weeks to go to what? You see, to the start of the new academic well, year for 50 year pupils. Well, going into the start. My son is just about to start well, sixth but, year. You but know, but I, on, I know but, this as a but these are so. these are change These are changes to the assessment arrangements that will have an implication for the coursework, or the, 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 the coursework assessment yep. and the final examination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't change the course content. Well, no, they don't, Mr. Scott. They don't change the course content. And that's and, and I think this is the point that has to be understood. And I've sought reassurance from the SQA on this point because course, as I understand it, course content has been changed in the biology 
uh, course with material being removed from the course. But course content is not... So the point, I appreciate that the stuff came out with three weeks to go before the start of the, of the, the school term, of the, 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 the bit before the summer holidays. But the course content was not changing. What was changing was the balance of assessment. And that's a really important distinction. It's not a pedantic point. It's a fundamental point that I think has been misconstrued in this discussion. So why did Lynn Robertson say the SQA is not interested in dialogue? Basically, and I quote, I'm not, this is not me making this up, basically we were told what the changes were. Well, because the, there was a requirement from the Assessment and National Qualifications Group supported by the trade unions in this country that they wanted the unit assessments removed for 1718. Yeah. So the SQA cannot move any faster when they've got an exam diet to preside over to do stuff as quickly as that. So ideally, the SQA, the SQA would say to me, look, um, give us more time. Everyone wants more time. But if the professional associations want as unit assessments removed in 1718, and that was what the demand was, I fulfilled that demand, but people have to accept the consequences of it. Thank you. I think we, we've kind of veered off course a wee bit there. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Ruth? No, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'd like to um, explore a bit more about initial teacher education um, and specifically um, the placements. Um, the committee heard sort of varying evidence about people's experience of, of placements. Um, some of it was around the, the administration of it and when they were actually told where they were going to go. Um, and the bit that, that concerned me was around um, the, the quality of experience that students were having um, between different schools and sometimes within the same local authorities. And there seemed to be... Um, evidence that some of it was um, down to the goodwill of, of individual um, mentors. So I'd be interested to hear um, your reflections on how local authorities, um, because of course it is their um, responsibility, I guess the, the, the buck does kind of stop with them, to ensure that, that mentors in school placements have got the required time and the, the skill to support our student teachers and make sure that that, that placement is a valuable experience for them. The placement element of initial teacher education is a really fundamental part of how teachers acquire the necessary skills that they require to, uh, to, to participate within the profession. And it's also, I think, a really substantial part of the professional role of teachers to convey their experience and their knowledge to incoming um, aspiring teachers. So I think it's essentially it's in everybody's interests for the student placement to be a worthwhile and valuable experience, uh, to enhance the opportunity for those aspiring teachers and for experienced teachers to be able to convey their expertise and knowledge to individuals, but then also to, um, to be able to um, learn from some of the work that is undertaken with, the, with new teachers. So that interaction, to me, is a, a really fundamental part of the effectiveness of, of the student placement system. It also um, is, a, is an opportunity for us to take forward some of the continuous professional development that Claire Hockey was talking about to, to enhance the profession. Obviously, it's got to operate in a, um, in a seamless fashion. And I asked the GTCS... Uh, the Association of Directors of Education and the universities to jointly review the system and to take action to help to improve the, 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 the process to ensure that individuals get as much clarity and notice and awareness about where they're going for their placements because I think it is important that, that people have that knowledge and are able to take it forward timorously. Um, so I think as, as a, a core element of our professional approach, I think it's... Um, I think it's an, an essential component of uh, our, our approach to initial teacher education, but I also think it's got to be delivered in a fashion that meets the needs of, of everybody involved. And I think, finally, student placements obviously help to 
to provide some additional expertise within schools to help us to deliver the curriculum, which is obviously something that's very beneficial. Um, it, it was suggested that it, it might be appropriate that there be um, some sort of service level agreement between the local authorities and the universities. Um, do, do you have any thoughts on, on that? I, uh, whether we call it a service level agreement or, or, or a, a joint bit of working, it's in everybody's interest you know, the, the, to, to make sure that um, student teachers are able to fulfil their placements within the education system. They can do that timorously and effectively and as a consequence to be able to, 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 to make that contribution to the system. So I think there's, a, there's a, 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 an onus on everybody to make sure the system works. It's not just something that needs the local authorities to do something different or the universities to do something different. We we'll have to focus on the interests of the students themselves and make sure that all the arrangements are put in place to meet their, uh, their needs and their opportunities. Okay, thank you. Joanne's got a short supplementary. It was on this question of mentors. You say it's in everybody's interest for this to work. Some of the evidence we got was obviously that people under pressure were being asked to be mentors and we find it very difficult to fill that role, not out of any sense of hostility to the, the, to the student, but simply because of their own pressures. Um, is there any, is there any um, consideration of finding a way of actually recognising that role, whether it's through remuneration or by time, to make sure that actually the schools are able to deliver for the, the students in a real way, rather than having somebody who theoretically is mentoring you, but actually is already under the kind of pressures I described earlier, and not able to do that job since is such a fundamentally important thing for a, a new a student or a new teacher to have as effective monitoring. Our, our schools are and always have been busy places. Uh, so there's a lot going on. Now, what we've got to try to tackle is whether or not there is stuff going on that is unnecessary and that is not actually central to the learning and teaching experience. And that was the guidance that I gave to the, to the profession last August to look very carefully and hard, and not just the profession, but at the bureaucracy of education, local authorities, Education Scotland, SQA, to try to ensure that we minimise the burdens that uh, are placed on people, and so that we can ensure that all of the core elements of education can be fulfilled. And I would judge the student placement system and its successful operation as one of the core elements of our education system, because that's how new aspiring teachers acquire a lot of their classroom experience and expertise. So I think we, we have to tackle that issue by trying to address the wider issues of the congestion within the classroom and within the education environment, which, as I've said to the committee on a number of occasions, um, is at the heart of the agenda I'm taking forward. And that, that question of burdens, I, mean, I get the importance of reducing bureaucracy, stripping out some of the unnecessary elements in assessment and so on, but certainly anecdotally, and I would compare it again with my own time in teaching, some of the burdens on the teaching profession are administrative burdens that would in the past have been done by a school auxiliary or a support member or an admin member. And a lot of these posts have gone and teachers report they spend a lot of time doing that bit of the work, which is clearly not, in my view, is not core to their, their job. And is, is there, how do we ensure that there's proper investment in local authorities to allow them to have that kind of support, which actually just simply reduces the burden and, and, and allows <clears throat> the core work of a teacher to, to be concentrated on? This is not unnecessary stuff. It is photocopying or whatever. And I wonder if that's something that you've looked at. Well, certainly, you know, as, as part of my work, my focus on workload, I want to ensure that teachers are, the words I've used, liberated to concentrate on learning and teaching. And that's the, that's what needs to be at the top of their priorities, and I want the system to reflect that as well. So the onus is on local authorities to, um, to support schools and to equip schools with the resources that enable them to, uh, teachers to concentrate on that, on that process of learning and teaching and for the tasks that don't need to be undertaken by teachers to be undertaken by, um, uh, if they are necessary, to be undertaken by others within the school environment. I think we're in a position where schools are reporting 
teachers are reporting that they are doing these jobs that would have been t 10, 15, 20 years ago done by support staff. And yeah. how do we address that? It's, you, it's, you can say, well, local authorities should make sure. I'm assuming that local authorities, like everybody in this room, is committed to delivering education. How do we ensure that they have the means by which they can have a prop? It's not just teacher workforce planning, but workforce planning more generally happening in education. Obviously, you know, as Joanne Lallant knows, the local authorities are responsible for the delivery of education in our communities. I don't take those decisions. It's local authorities. You make very big decisions about the financing of local authorities. Well, well, and, and I think local authorities have been well supported financially by the government, given the resources available to the Scottish government in the periods of austerity. Right, okay, I, I accept there's an election next week, so let's skip back to the workforce planning. Uh, solely the workforce for planning. Answer. Okay, uh, Ross Thompson, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, in both oral and written evidence to the committee um, on this issue, we heard about the challenges in recruitment and retention of teachers in the North East and, and the North of Scotland, um, and measures that local authorities are taking, like Murray, Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen City, to help address that. We also heard directly from the trainee teachers about that sort of natural bias to gravitate towards the central belt in taking um, positions. And it was Lawrence Findlay from Murray that said that in relation to local schemes to attract you know, the these trainee teachers up to the area, that it was important that local authorities didn't try to outbid each other. Um, and sometimes I've seen an element of that myself between Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire when you're trying to get people when you're so des desperate to do it. He suggested that a national scheme um, could also help tied in with obviously local delivery too. Is this something which the Scottish Government is looking at uh, in terms of nationally how we can incentivise those who have gone through teacher training, particularly in the central belt, to come up to the areas where actually we've got a lot of vacancy? If I read Mr Finlay's evidence correct, I thought Mr Finlay was arguing for local authorities to have even more scope to take local decisions. I'm not, I don't quite follow how a national scheme would actually help to support that um, local priority. In, in answer to my question, he did talk about the lo local knowledge being really important in a local scheme, um, but said it is important that local authorities don't outbid each other in terms of golden hellos, for example, who can give the most money, who can give the better package. And that actually, in relation to my question, he said that he would welcome a national scheme not to overrule or to, um, uh, to uh, mitigate against anything local, but to support what was happening local to prevent that competition. I, I venture to suggest there's a contradiction between those two points of view, because how can a national scheme do anything other than overrule a local scheme if it's a local competition between two authorities outbidding each other, which is the problem? I don't, I don't understand the logic of that point. I, I'm obviously just referring to the evidence that he gave to the committee. I know, where I'm he simply is, saying is, I don't understand. <laughs> where he actually I'm simply, I'm suggested the, a national scheme. I'm simply making the point that if, if, if the purpose of a national scheme is to avoid local authorities outbidding each other, mm -hmm. So its effect is to stop that local variation. Then we've overruled what happens locally. And I'm just pointing out that I don't understand how that can be done. Have you done any work to look at what local authorities are doing and if that competition is taking place? Well, we obviously work with local authorities to try to ensure they have the adequate uh, range of skilled professionals in each local authority to meet their teaching needs. Um, I'm uh, acutely aware of the work that is going on within the Northern Alliance to try to um, facilitate cooperation in this respect, and it's welcome, and I um, am supporting that work that's being undertaken. Um, the, the other point, and this goes back to one of the points that Joanne Lamont raised with me, is about um, the profile of people that may wish to enter the teaching profession from um, some of the more rural localities. Mm -hmm. We have to be adaptable in that respect to make sure that if individuals wish to um, enter the profession but they are um, entrenched in living in a rural part of Scotland, that they don't particularly want to go and live somewhere else, that our teacher training system addresses their desires and their aspirations so that bluntly everybody doesn't have to come to Glasgow or Edinburgh to get teacher training. They can do it in other parts of the country. And obviously, 
uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands has taken forward a number of these um, measures through distance learning. So I think th th there are certainly ways in which we can provide the necessary assistance to um, uh, local authorities in advancing some of that agenda. And, and thank you very much for your answer, Cabinet Secretary. In the opening statement to um, the committee, when talking about those new routes into education, you said that the recruitment campaigns were a central plank of the Scottish Government's efforts. Um, back in February 2016, we had the announcement in Aberdeen of the Transition Training Fund. Um, we were told in the, the Press and Journal and BBC, and I quote, that it, would that it will lead to more high quality, passionate teachers in the area. The most recent figures from Aberdeen itself say that they had five trainees go through the programme, three of which dropped out, two of which dropped out to return to oil and gas. Therefore, two teachers will shortly be starting at Hazel Head Academy. Given this was meant to help plug the hundreds of vacancies that there are across city and shire, do you think the Transition Training Fund, in relation to teaching, has been a failure? Uh, well, it's certainly been um, an attempt by the government to provide a route for people who had lost their employment in the oil and gas sector to find a different career if they wished to do so. Uh, so, uh, no, I don't. I think it's important that the government tries to be helpful to local authorities. That's just what Mr Thompson has asked me to do in his earlier question. So the government has been helpful to the North East of Scotland, put in place the resources, and has tried to be helpful to oil and gas workers who faced hard times. We heard in evidence just last week um, that actually the scheme, in the view of one of the witnesses, um, hadn't been um, successful. And we've had constituents getting in touch, uh, as well as it's been reported in the press that some of the issues have been run about barriers in terms of accessing the scheme, barriers to accessing funding. Um, will the Cabinet Secretary look at maybe undertaking a review of how the scheme has worked, particularly since local authorities are still waiting to hear whether or not the scheme will be continued? So as you're looking to do that, will you look at the issues that there's been and what changes could be made to maybe make it more accessible and reduce those barriers so we can get people into teaching and we can get these vacancies filled? Well, I'm certainly... Um very happy to look at how we can encourage more people to use this device. It's what people asked us to do, so the government's put it in place, and I certainly want to make sure people can use those opportunities. Welcome that. Thank you. Gillian Martin, you wanted to come in here. The case that perhaps the rhetoric around teaching that I mentioned earlier might be a way of actually get encouraging more people to actually access the transition training scheme. And another also that made the point, actually, the transition training scheme is my understanding that it's not just to get oil and gas workers into teaching, but into any other sectors that are needing to recruit. Um, but certainly, it, certainly the, the, you know, the rhetoric around teaching, I think if, it, if the narrative changed in that respect, I think that would be helpful. Now, one of the witnesses did say that they thought that one of the reasons why it, the, the teaching aspect of it was unsuccessful was that they felt that, correct me if I'm wrong here, but they, they felt that the workers who came from the oil industry hadn't realised exactly what teaching involved until they got involved in it, and then clearly they, they thought it was too much for them. So there's a number of reasons why. Yes, and, 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 and I think, like, going back to some of the points that Mr Johnson raised with me earlier on about the, 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 fact, the reasons why people sometimes don't continue to pursue a career in teaching is that they, 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 they don't find it as they would have expected to find it and make a different choice. And you know, people are entitled to make these choices if they, if they, if they, if they so wish. OK, thank you. Uh, Ross Green. Convener, I'd like to just go back to additional support needs for a moment. And uh, Cabinet Secretary, you touched on it in your opening remarks, and I'll come back to initial teacher education in a moment. But we've heard consistently, not just in the course of the evidence that we've gathered for uh, this particular area of our work, but throughout the last year in speaking to newly qualified teachers and students, um, or even teachers who've been in the profession for some time, about that lack of confidence. They don't feel able to fully support young people with additional support needs. And that is partly due to initial teacher education, which I said I'll ask about in a moment. But do you recognise that it's also in part 
due to the loss of the specialist support staff. So newly qualified teachers are entering the classroom without the specialist staff who would have otherwise, who would have previously been there with them to support young people with additional support needs. I think there's a, 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 a context that's important to consider around this point. And it's, to me, it's the most important point. And that is that if we are making a judgment as a system that a young person with additional support needs can be educated in a mainstream setting, we have to make sure the right support and resources are in place to enable that to be the case. That is the key point. And I've seen the evidence the committee has taken on additional support needs, and I, as the committee knows, I've written to the convener to this effect, that I planned to um, issue a consultation on new guidance about mainstreaming, but I've decided I committed to do that on the 19th of May, but I've paused that until I see what the committee reports on this subject so that I can reflect on that before I issue the new guidance, because that's the key test. Because every young person who has additional support needs must be entitled to have the support available to them that they require in whatever educational setting. So if we're going to decide that a young person's needs can be met within mainstreaming, a mainstream setting, we have to make sure the support is in place. But if we decide that that young person's needs can be met or need to be met in a specialist provision, that has to be put in place as well. So fundamentally, I come back to that point that a judgment has to be arrived at as to um, whether the young person's needs can be met in a mainstream setting and what intervention is required to make that the case and therefore to make it then possible for a teacher to be able to support that young person and the other young people they are responsible for educating as part of the classroom setting. I accept that. I would hope that the presumption to mainstream, which is an important inclusive principle, is not damaged simply because of resource pressures on schools and it being a relative of staff cuts that they decide a young person can't be inclusively uh, educated. But going back to the point about newly qualified teachers... I think, I think what, what I'm saying in my answer, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm making the same point as Mr Greer, I'm a, I'm a fundamental believer in the principle of mainstreaming. But if we are going to put a young person, make a judgment a young person can be educated in a mainstream setting, they must have the resources to do that. Now, I think it's likely that a young person educated, who's not educated in the mainstream setting, but educated in a special educational provision, the cost will be greater of doing that than being in a mainstream setting. But what, I, what would be concerning me is whether the young person can be fulfilled unless they're properly supported. And that's the point I'm trying to get across. I absolutely agree with that. But going back to the point around the teacher, and education is young person-centred, and that's right, but the point around the teacher, do you recognise that there is a, a confidence issue amongst newly qualified teachers because they're being expected to do more and more directly support in a more specialised way young people than their predecessors were simply because the additional staff, the special staff, are not there. That this is also a confidence issue amongst teachers. And that has a, a whole range of other effects, including on retention, which was discussed earlier. I think there are two, I think there are two separate issues here. One is, I don't doubt that a new teacher coming into the classroom and um, working with a young person with additional support needs and having not done so before will um, certainly you know, will, will lack the confidence in how they're able to, to handle that situation. I think that would be quite a natural thing because it will be unfamiliar and they won't know all their way around it. So I, 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 I don't doubt that factor. But I come back to the point that I've been labouring in my earlier answers. That teacher, however lacking in confidence they may feel, must be able to rely upon the right support being in place for that young person who, to make sure their needs are met. So it's not just about the confidence issue of teachers. Some of that confidence issue will be mitigated by there being the right other support in place to assist them in what they're trying to do. Absolutely um, agree with that. Going to the initial teacher education, you mentioned in your opening statement um, your proposal to meet with the GTCS and deans of education.
Could you outline a bit more detail what your objective is there in terms of the consistency between courses? Because that came up quite strongly in our evidence, the inconsistency specifically in relation to additional support needs. What I want to do is to make sure that we um, can be assured that there is due account being taken of the essential ingredients that are required in the in initial teacher education are being properly met. And the question I have looking at the data is that the range on some of these attributes is so broad that it raises questions in my mind about whether or not all of the provision is um, is as consistent as it, as it needs to be. Now, um, you know, there may be, a, there may be a, a, a good explanation for that, but I just feel the range requires explanation and examination. Um, An area that the GTCS should be taking the lead on, if they're the, the, strengthening their guidance. Well, the GTCS um, essentially are the, they sign off the initial teacher education propositions from each um, school of education. Um, so yesterday, for example, um, they signed off two new courses in the University of the West of Scotland um, to uh, take forward uh, new opportunities in initial teacher education. So GTCS certificated those and announced that yesterday. Um, so it is a combination of the, the universities formulating courses that meet the needs of um, student teachers uh, and the GTCS essentially validating and accrediting those, those courses. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. You've got a very short supplementary. Very last point about the, the accreditation and evaluation. I mean, one of the things that's been flagged is that GTCS is, is responsible for accreditation, but it's Education Scotland that then uh, does sort of the, the inspection. I mean, is, is this something that might be looked at in your, your governance review? Do you think there is, is a a question around the relationship between that accreditation and, 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 and uh, inspection regime? Well, I, th I think there's, there's, there's a complicated, yes, in short is the answer, but there is a complicated set of arrangements here because the universities are, as Liz Smith will tell me, autonomous bodies and therefore free to decide their course content. But, we, but you know, the, there is, I think, a legitimate right for us to be confident that what is being provided is appropriate for our requirements. Thank you. Um, just to finish off, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you, talk about, you talked about teaching makes people earlier on, and that, that, that it's been receiving quite a number of uh, visits and positive reviews. What do, how do you take the interest that's been shown and try and encourage those people then to to go into teaching? Well, essentially, what we're trying to do with the campaign uh, is to tackle some of the issues that Gillian Martin raises about people's views about the teaching profession, how we can interest and motivate more people to decide to enter the teaching profession. The, in 2015-16, the, 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 the campaign that we launched resulted in, well, it contributed to a 19% increase in the number of university graduates entering postgraduate teacher education courses in Scotland. Now, I'm not trying to say that was the only factor, but it contributed too. Um, so obviously we look to try to encourage and to motivate people to um, participate in the profession. The initial contacts are made at the recruitment fairs. I attended one of those recruitment fairs at the University of Glasgow, and um, the campaign was a very, was one of these recruitment fairs, it was a very energetic uh, stall and trying to encourage people to participate and obviously we take contacts we follow that up and try to encourage um, young people to, 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 to take an interest within any of the institutions that are participating Okay that was a bit I was interested in the follow up. Okay thank you very much and in that case I draw the session to close. I'd like to thank you very much for your time and uh, your answers uh, and I close the public session